Hi, everyone. It's Georgia here. This week's episode is going to start in just a minute. But first, I wanted to say a big thank you to those of you who have already become monthly donors. As many of you know, we are asking that 30 of you, dear listeners, become new monthly supporters by the end of June. I am really happy to report that we're just over a third of the way there, but that means we still need about 20 of you to raise your hand and join our team. This is all about creating a sustainable, listener-supported community, and we're serious when we say that every donation counts. So please head over to QuakerPodcast.com, click support at the top of the page, and find out how you can help us reach our goal. Thank you so much. Now, here's the episode. I want you to know that ministry is contextualized. When Quakerism came to Africa, it has to be contextualized to the African perspective in order for us to connect with it. If we have to do it the British way, we don't connect. And that's why silent worship could not be an African connection. Because African spirituality is found in sound, in making noise, then you get your connection to your spirituality. Silence does not connect you to spirituality from the African perspective. That's why many churches, you have come here, you will find them that are uh, singing and having drums and beating them up and down and dancing up on the road and dancing. That's how they connect to their spirituality. And that's what I would say. Christianity is always contextualized to the cultural perspective. The, 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 the podcast. Story, spirit, sound. Hi, I'm Georgia Sparling. Today we are talking about Kenya and I've got a special guest host. So say hello, special guest host. Hello there. I'm Hannah Mayer. So Hannah is our operations manager at The Quaker, but she actually got to go out on assignment recently. That's right. It was my very first time ever doing interviews or using recording equipment or anything like that. (laughs) We really threw you into the deep end, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, you you did. It was a little stressful, but a really good experience on the whole. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Um, So you were going to Kenya anyway for a wedding, and we were already planning to do an episode about Kenyan Quakers. Right. It was just too good an opportunity for the podcast to pass up. So I really couldn't say no. You really couldn't. (laughs) Um, But yeah, this episode is all about Kenyan friends who make up the largest population of Quakers in the world. And we really wanted to explore what Quakerism looks like around the world. Last season, we had a really popular episode on Quakers in Australia, and we have plans to visit other countries to learn about how friends practice their faith there, what unites them, what makes them different. And today, we're going to explore those topics with Kenyan friends. What do they believe? What challenges are they facing? How and why have their numbers grown so much? But before we jump into that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experiences, Hannah, since I've only gotten to speak with Kenyan friends remotely. Well, I was pretty nervous to go. Uh, I just knew that I was going to be surrounded by a lot of unfamiliarity because I've never been to Kenya. I mean, I've never been to Africa before. And then I had interviews and recording equipment to manage that were pretty unfamiliar too. But it's a gorgeous place. I spent pretty much all my time in Kasumu, which we're going to hear a little bit more about later in this episode. But it's a sizable city right on Lake Victoria. And it's got these weather patterns that reminded me of San Diego, like mid 80s during the day and low to mid 60s at night. Just dreamy, right? Yeah, that sounds like heaven because it is already hot and humid here in Mississippi. Yeah, no, it really (laughs) was delightful. And another really lovely thing, there was this super strong culture of hospitality. Like everywhere I went, I was offered mixed tea, which is this really yummy, sweet black tea that's pretty ubiquitous there. And everyone was excited to feed me and just make sure I was really comfortable and, you know, taking really good care of me. And it was a really full trip. 
We were there for this wedding, which was actually two ceremonies on different days. And the day in between, I went to Friends Theological College, which is also known as FTC, and got to talk with its principal, Dr. Robert Wafula. Yeah, we had talked to Dr. Wafula briefly before your trip, but I didn't realize until I heard your interview that the college is actually the training ground for Kenya's Quaker ministers. So what did you do when you went to visit the campus? Dr. Wafula took me to join the school tea time where I met some of the students and faculty and learned that many of the students are actually already pastors in their own right, which I thought that was cool. I also got a tour of campus and it was really beautiful. After Dr. Wafula became principal, he established a forest on campus that provides a quiet space in nature for students. It's actually part of each student's duties to plant a tree and tend to it during their time on campus, which, I don't know, I think that really lines up with the Quaker stewardship testimony to me. Yeah, I really love that. That's just, I mean, very sweet, but also, I don't know, it just seems like a really cool experience that the students can take with them. Right? Yeah. I want to learn how to tend a tree. And they also have a lovely chapel, which is totally round and organized with chairs in a circle. And, you know, that's a setup for Quaker worship that feels very familiar to me. They host meeting there every morning. And actually, every Thursday, it's unprogrammed worship, which is kind of unheard of in Kenya. So I thought that was really cool. They also generate their own power through solar panels on their buildings, which Like, I think a lot of U.S. meetings and Quaker communities would like to do that. Um, And some of them have, but most have not figured it out yet, I think. But that's really remarkable. Um, Thanks so much for sharing that and for taking on this brand new experience. It was truly my pleasure. One thing I do want to know is that you also visited a Quaker church on Easter while you were there. I did. And we're going to share a little tiny bit of that in today's episode. But next week, we're devoting the whole episode to the vocal ministry at Friends Church Manyata. So we'll have Hannah back on then. But without further ado, I think we should get started with this episode. Since I first started interviewing people about Quakerism, I've been told many times that Kenya is where the Quakers are. And if that were true, then obviously we had to do an episode on them. So I did a little research, and yep, everyone's correct. In 2012, which I know was a long time ago now, there were nearly 150,000 Kenyan friends out of 377,000 worldwide. That's according to the Friends World Committee for Consultation. Today, that number is closer to 450,000 Quakers in Kenya alone. And Kelly Kellum, the director of Friends United Meeting, estimates that there are probably at least that many who fall into the category of being culturally Quaker, meaning they have some sort of association or maybe were raised Quaker, but aren't found on any membership roles. So in a country of around 54 million people, that's about a million people who would identify themselves as Quaker in some way. So... For this episode, I wanted to understand how Quakerism took hold in Kenya and also what makes Kenyan Quakers distinct. To do that, we, meaning Hannah and I, spoke with a variety of Quakers. Many of those were leaders, such as pastors or people with director in their title. But I also wanted to hear from regular, everyday Quakers. So I called up a young woman named Laura Nayere. I've actually been raised and born in a Quaker church. So my parents uh, are Quakers. That is the only church that I've known since I was born. I've grown up knowing the morals, the values, the doctrine of uh, Quaker all my life. Laura attends the French Church of Nyongo Road, the biggest Quaker church in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. She's a journalist and a TV producer with Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, and she's very involved in her church. So I asked her to tell me more about it. I'll describe it as a church that carry all the work that Jesus started. So we are like literally finishing the work that Jesus did. And one of the things that I love about Quakers is the simplicity. Not that you don't want to live a lavish life or so, but you believe that Jesus was simple. And because we are following his doctrine, of course, we are simple. So being into the Quaker church has taught me that life is of course, you have to love Christ. 
You have to be his friend because even the Bible says, you are my friends if you are called by, by my name. So we believe if we are called by his name, then we are friends. That's why we call it uh, Friends Church Quakers. So we are the friends of Christ. As you may have surmised from Laura, the Kenyan Friends Church is evangelical. There isn't really a non-evangelical branch, as far as I can tell. And that's probably because Kenyan Quakerism was introduced in 1902 by three men from the American Midwest. Willis Hotchkiss, Edgar Hall, and Arthur Chilson. That's Kelly Kellum, the General Secretary of Friends United Meeting. I think that probably to understand that, you kind of have to understand what was happening in the in Christian communities in the Midwest at that time, where there was a lot of revival activity. This was the same time that Friends were in the Midwest were adopting the pastoral system of, of, of worship and leadership. And it was also a time when there were a lot of student revivals that were happening on college campuses. And out of that came a, a really a robust missionary call and purpose, of which influenced many friends as well. The three men came over with an organization that eventually became Friends United Meeting. Today, that's an international organization. We have 37 yearly meetings. 23 of them in Kenya. And we work together in collaboration with those yearly meetings to provide um, engagement and outreach opportunities globally. So Hotchkiss, Hall, and Chilson were three missionaries from the United States who brought Quakerism to Kenya during the British colonial expansion into East Africa. And that expansion included a new railroad. The government assigned missionaries entering the country to specific regions, and that went for our three Quaker missionaries. They got on the railway, and they went inland as far as they possibly could, which was to Kisumu at Lake Victoria. And from there, they were sent off into the hills where they then established the Kaimosi um, Friends Mission, which was a place that they had this sense of divine leading that this is the place where friends need to find themselves. Early on, friends' evangelism model really was was a holistic type of um, approach where we will certainly want to proclaim the gospel, but at the same time, provide medical support, provide education as well as to provide a means of economic support. As they became more established and provided schools and hospitals and job training, more Kenyans began to convert to Quakerism. More missionaries also came to Kenya, including some from the UK, and new meetings were established. Among those missionaries were Kelly's own grandparents, who moved to Kenya in 1923. My grandfather established the Quaker education system that is actually in place now within Kenya, and help, which became the, the foreground of establishing the Friends Teachers Training College, as well as um, um, many of the 1,400 Quaker schools that are present in Kenya today. My grandmother was a nurse, and she was involved in two hospitals, the Kaimosi Hospital as well as the Lagulu Hospital in Kenya. The Lagulu Hospital is still operated by Quakers today, and actually many present-day Quakers in Kenya can trace their religious and familial heritage to the early Quaker converts. I called up Dr. Esther Mambo, a professor of theology at St. Paul's University in Lemuru, Kenya. She's also a third-generation Quaker. Unfortunately, our audio didn't turn out great, but I've got a voice actor to read Dr. Mambo's words. My grandmother on my mother's side was among the first Quaker women in her village, or the first woman to break up with tradition and join the Quaker school or Quaker community as they were at that time. So I lived with her, and a lot of my theology, my Quakerism, actually emanates from her. My interest also. She had a great impact on me as one of the first Quaker women preachers, so her life and work had a great impact on me in terms of choosing to study theology and also to study the lives of the Quaker history. The Bible was central to the missionary's work, and it left an impact on Dr. Mambo's grandmother. The Bible actually was a textbook that was used for reading and writing, but also something that they read and memorized. 
So my grandmother would talk about Bible stories, not necessarily reading them, but just telling them as part of their life story. So the message of Jesus Christ in terms of the love of God to the world, sending Jesus to die for the world and asking people to be converted, to accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's the message that they were introduced to. As well as that, they were then introduced to the Quaker ethos of peace, of justice, of truth, of stewardship. Yet becoming a Christian and a Quaker came at a cost. It meant leaving behind the religious beliefs of your tribe. Dr. Mambo has interviewed women from that first generation of Quakers, and she said some lost marriage prospects because of their conversion and worse. So for them, it was not just accepting the Lord's book of Jesus Christ. It was also to prove by breaking off some of the cultural practices. And hearing the stories of these women, some of them even faced physical violence when they broke up with that taboo. My grandmother would say her brothers beat her up. By the 1960s, though, Quakerism had become well-established in Western Kenya, but change was coming in the form of a national rebellion. It was during that decade that the country finally won independence from England, and that vacuum of British leadership left foreign missionaries in particular danger. Many of them left Kenya in the 1960s, including most Quakers. This somewhat coincided with plans to hand leadership to local friends, but it left a gap in leadership. And those repercussions are still being felt today. And, and maybe this, this taps into the sin of colonialism as well. So what happened was during some of that transfer, there were some individuals who were not prepared for the roles and responsibilities they inherited. And there were some that was given tremendous power as well as access to resources, which unfortunately used that for their own personal benefit and not for the benefit of the mission for which it was intended. And that then created a lot of internal tensions that kind of sparked the, um, the, the divisions that has been part of the story of East African friends. So whether the, all these yearly meetings will be reunified in the future, we don't, you know, that, that may be a miracle too much to hope for. The seeds of some of that is rooted in how the missionaries left. And we, we have to answer to that in, 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 in the most humbling and transparent ways, I think, in order for there to be full healing and restoration. So people kept talking about both Friends United Meeting and Friends Church Kenya, and I was a bit confused about how they operate and what their role is among the 27 yearly meetings in Kenya. Yeah, 27. <laughs> they have a lot of meetings there. So Kelly helped to clarify that. FUM has that more regional Africa focus and, and mission, whereas Friends Church Kenya focuses specifically on Kenya. French Church Kenya f focuses on advocacy work. They're the ones who represent Quaker groups to the National Council of Churches of Kenya. They, they're the group that represents the Friends interest in any lobbying issues with the government, um, and as well as they deal with some with some of the internal dynamics that happens when you have 27 yearly meetings in a really close proximity to each other, and we're trying to figure out how do we get along. And so th that relational piece, the scope of that is, is falls under Friends Church Kenya. For Friends United Meeting, we really are focused on, on specific projects and programs. As far as beliefs go, the Kenyan Friends Church is unapologetically based on the Bible. So we value the scripture so much that gives us the guidance, the leadership, whatever we do. That's Dr. John Muhanji, the director of Friends United Meeting African Ministries, which is based in Kisumu, Kenya. I spoke with Dr. Muhanji last year for our very first episode, Who Are Modern Quakers? And I went back to that conversation for today's episode. 
Back then, I really had no idea just how many different expressions of Quakerism existed, but I knew that Kenyans did not worship silently like the unprogrammed meetings that I'd heard about. We sing, you come to our worship, prepare to sing, prepare to dance, we, and uh, you, you will dance as we sing our hymns. Uh, we pray uh, vocally, loudly. We don't uh, just keep quiet. We'll get into this a little bit more in next week's episode, but Kenyan friends have pastors and other church staff, similar to other pastoral Quaker meetings in the U.S., but they have their own style of worship. That audio was from French church men yada. And yeah, not a quiet meeting. So I'm told that smaller rural meetings may tend towards more traditional music and hymns, while the larger urban meetings have newer music and more instruments. But they're all singing. While this and the sheer volume of Kenyan friends can't be rivaled anywhere else in the world, but they are similar to other Quakers in a few key areas. Like most Christ-centered friends, they don't observe Christian sacraments. No communion or baptism. Kenyans are also committed to the Quaker testimonies, a.k.a. the spices, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. It comes up often in conversation, as it did when Hannah went to visit Dr. Robert Wafula, the principal of Friends Theological College. I'm curious about what the tenets, the beliefs Mm -hmm. of Friends in Kenya are. We share the same tenets, Quaker testimonies with the rest of the Quaker world, Quaker testimony of peace, Simplicity, stewardship. I'm just mixing those spices. Yeah. <laughs> so we share all those Quaker testimonies. Uh, we embrace them. We we value them. That's evident in Kenyan Friends Ministries, which mirror the work established by missionaries in the first half of the 20th century. So we, we are a, a holistic ministry, not just focusing on spiritual matters alone. Because God did not put us on this world just to be praying and, uh, and focusing on him. He gave us the authority to pray, worship him, but also empower ourselves to find what to eat and how to progress and improve where we are living. So the, and that's what I've found joy uh, in doing. Uh, we run several schools in Kenya, and uh, one of the, we are one of the churches that have a, a higher number of schools in this country. There's also a commitment to community health. A sick community is completely as good as dead. So we believe in a healthy community that is informed, a healthy community that is having education. If you have to create peace, you must be healthy to go and create peace somewhere else. And peace is perhaps the most well-known characteristic of Kenyan friends. Dr. Wafula says peace was embraced by Kenyan Quakers from the very beginning. So I, w- I would say that the, the aspect of uh, Quaker testimony has really helped um, the spread of Quakerism. And that's what identifies us from other, other churches, other denominations, other Christian churches. Say Quakers are people of peace. They call it Watu uh, Wamulembe in Kiswahili. Watu Wamulembe, the people of peace. But what happens when peace breaks down? After the break, we talk with a Kenyan friend who has repeatedly put her life on the line to bring peace to Kenya. If you're the sort of person who listens to a lot of podcasts, then you might know that some of them are independent and some of them have bigger organizations behind them, which allows them to leverage all of their shows to get big advertisers and large sponsorships. Well, we're one of the independent ones. That means we have lots of freedom to tell the stories that we want to tell, but also that we are a little scrappy. 
So we are working hard to put together good, spiritually resonant episodes while also working to make this project sustainable. And that is where you come in. I've got four relatively easy ways that you can help the Quaker podcast. Here they are. One, become one of our monthly donors. Right now, this is one of the best things you can do to help us. We have a goal of getting 30 new monthly donors by the end of June. And for 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 bucks a month, you can help us reach that goal, which soon will come with some extra perks. You can go to quakerpodcast.com and click the support button at the top of the page to do that. Two, tell your friends. We can't really have too many listeners. That is not a thing. (laughs) So would you send a friend or two a link to your favorite episode? You can do that in a text message or tag them in one of our social media posts. It's so easy. Three, advertise with us. We definitely want to keep using this spot to tell many stories, but it's also a great place to let our audience know about your project, and we'll help you put it all together. Just go to quakerpodcast.com slash advertise for more information. Four, leave a review. Apple Podcasts is probably the easiest way to do this, but feel free to leave a review on the podcast platform of your choice. Tell folks what you like about the show and maybe a favorite episode. It really helps people decide if it's something they want to listen to. So if this show has impacted you in any way, then would you please consider supporting us? We want to be around for a long time, and you can help us achieve that. Thank you so much. And now back to the episode. Everyone thought Kenya was a peaceful country, and it had enjoyed an extended period of harmony up until December 2007. Suspicions of election fraud showed fissures that had been growing under the surface for some time. Fissures along tribal lines that quickly erupted into a crisis that displaced more than 300,000 people and resulted in more than 1,000 deaths. Getri Giza has a vivid memory of that election and its violent aftermath. So a lot of, of damage had, had happened and nobody was paying attention because Kenya was believed to be a peaceful country. Nobody thought we could kill each other. It was really a wake-up call for Quakers, and it led to the foundation of the French Church Peace Team. Getri is a program officer with Friends United Meeting and part of the Friends Peace Team, which focuses primarily on peace and reconciliation. It's a ministry that sometimes puts her face-to-face with machete-wielding militia groups. When I talked to Getri, she was in her car on her way to Kakamenga in western Kenya. We started our conversation by talking about the election. People were unsettled. People were crying. They needed counseling. They needed medication. So we jumped in with teams of colleagues who had, who had volunteered themselves, and we were able to have a, give a listening ear to those who are grieving. But we also had, uh, as Quakers, we mobilized our Quaker hospital and got medication for families that needed to be attended to. We were looking at also supply of sanitary towels for the women, because where they are, it's not their home. But also trying to make sure that we mobilize food and clothes among the Quakers in Kenya and take them to these people. So we did an emergency response by giving those basics, but also counseling sessions with those who feel, felt like they needed an, a person to hear them. They needed someone to talk to. Getri told me about the peace team's ongoing work to bring peace and reconciliation to Kenya. Since then, the peace team has developed a curriculum for schools where students and teachers from multiple tribes often converge. Then in the COVID era, these peace teams help students amid rising suicide rates, a poor economy, and illness. Getri's own introduction to peace work started when she was a young Quaker, curious about conflict resolution after growing up in a contentious polygamous household. The wives there did not get along. So it's inflicted in their children. So my heart was full of vengeance because of the past I went through. But she felt a calling to peacemaking. I normally tell people I'm not really a preacher, but I'm a person who brings people together. My, my, my most uh, strength part that I see God speaks is through the Psalms 23. Sometimes you go to an area that is very violent, 
we work with militia militia groups but i survive we go to places where there's a, been an a banditry attack when you pass people ask us how did you even come through that road it's not safe for you when god decide to send you go you don't resist because he has already prepared a way for you to go get you remembered one particular training session i'm training people in peace and conflict resolution and they're holding guns and machetes for them they're protecting themselves but they after three days they came without those machetes and say that actually we want to also be saved sometimes people interpret peace work as salvation and i think that's when god decides to show himself then she told me an even more harrowing story um i think i've, I've had a very quite interesting encounters in my life some some of them are threatening some of them are just funny but sometimes i ask myself how can this happen i remember of this day i went to kakuma refugee camp which is in northern kenya it's a big refugee camp where we have south sudan and uh, rwandese and burundi and congo people and on our way coming back we were in a small car we met bandits on the way although they were not they were hidden so they tried one of them tried stopping the car we were in and the driver refused to stop and what they did they started shooting and they shot the tires of the vehicle getry hid under the car unsure if she was really out of view as the robbers plundered the vehicle after an hour or so of silence she and the other survivors got up and walked to the nearest police post getry said her dress was covered in blood from the attack I think I felt like I it's enough of peace work. I needed to be home and look for another career. So why am I being killed for, for what? But I still felt like God was giving me another reason to live because in my fear I felt the people I went to visit in Kakuma and did a training with them were more important. If the bandits had targeted me, I would have uh, as well have been died. But I think I was escaped for a reason. We eventually made it safe home with the with fear but somehow when I I was called to go again I didn't even think twice. I was already on a motorbike going back. I only talked to Getri for maybe an hour. but i'm really amazed and i don't know just kind of speechless by her commitment to peace she finds herself in these really dangerous situations and she stays there and even returns there because she believes peace is possible in these areas where there is so much brokenness and mistrust and peace is a challenge even among friends that's one of the biggest reasons that the number of yearly meetings has climbed to 27 So we're going to take a look at some of the challenges that are facing modern friends even as their numbers continue to grow. During her visit to Kenya, Hannah talked with Dr. Wafula about the factors that have contributed to the divisions. There are a lot of yearly meetings. Can you talk a little bit about that? Geographic access was a contributor and also at all size of course, population mm. contributed towards that. but then then we have some that just became yearly meetings because the leadership did not agree <laughs> with one another uh-huh. they just break away feeling that leadership has been concentrated in one one region or one area and so our needs are not being met so let us break off and form our own yearly meeting But then the trend continues. The new splinter group as it becomes a year meeting, there is a group within that that will feel dissatisfied <laughs> and also break off. So the uh, splitting of year meetings is it, it doesn't happen on theological grounds. When Dr. Muhanji became director of Friends United Meetings Africa office, one of his goals was to bring unity to the meetings. they developed the church leadership and brought together yearly meetings who were in conflict 
And I can tell you, and I'm proudly speaking to say, as I'm speaking to you right now, the Quaker Church is well united. The Quaker Church in Kenya is one, is carrying out its operation as a team, and we continue to see the church grow. Through Dr. Mohanji's efforts, as well as other friends in leadership, there has been greater unity among the yearly meetings in recent years. There are regular meetings amongst the leadership, as well as conferences where friends from different yearly meetings can come together. It doesn't seem like any yearly meetings will combine anytime soon, but one pastor I spoke with said that young people in the church long for even greater unity among Quakers. And retaining the young people in churches is a concern, as it is in many churches worldwide. Laura Nayere, who we heard from at the top of the show, said that some of her peers are drawn to churches with different styles of worship, but also doctrines like the prosperity gospel, which promises blessings from God in the form of wealth while downplaying more instructional messages around sin. And they want to go to a church where, you know, they're being told it's okay to do this because God will forgive you. But not being told, like in Quaker, not being told you are not supposed to do this, period. The role of women in ministry is also a topic of concern for some. Back in her college days, Dr. Mambo said she was one of the only women studying theology. Although women often have their own ministries and women-focused meetings, Dr. Mambo says that churches are often still led by men. My grandmother would talk about the Quaker women like Margaret Fell and others because that is what they were taught as they joined the mission centers. And she'd say that in the meetings, there was no hierarchy. People would talk to God and God would talk to them and everybody was allowed to minister. So that was for me fascinating. But when I went to a local congregation, I didn't see women minister and especially women preaching. But these challenges have not outpaced the growth of the church by any means. While they partner with friends in the United States, Britain, and beyond, Kenyan friends are growing because their ministry is culturally Kenyan, says Dr. Muhanji. Yeah, I want you to know that uh, ministry is contextualized. When Quakerism came to Africa, it has to be contextualized to the African perspective in order for us to connect with it. If we have to do it the British way, we don't connect. And that's why silent worship could not be an African connection. Because African spirituality is found in sound, in making noise, then you get your connector to your spirituality. Silence does not connect you to spirituality from the African perspective. That's why many churches, you will come here, you will find them that are uh, singing and having drums and beating them up and down and dancing up on the road and dancing. That's how they connect to their spirituality. And that's what I would say. Christianity is always contextualized to the cultural perspective. As evangelical Kenyan Quakers, they have broadened their scope over the years. Some British friends don't believe in doing missions work because they are still thinking that doing so is like when they were doing colonial work. This is completely different from how they did their colonial. We are not colonizing or trying to force people to become Christians. Quaker missionaries learn the language of the communities that they work in, and they also bring that holistic approach to their work. Converting them is bringing them into understanding and building schools for them, uh, building some clinics for them, and helping them to learn and become informed than ignorant. And as a result of doing so, we see the community becoming more empowered, more enlightened, and it has never remained the same. We have reached to the people called the Turkanas in the north. We have reached to the people called the Samburus. We have reached to the people along the coastline who have not known Christ to open up churches into their communities. We have also enriched the church in Tanzania. Through my office, We have seen the church in Tanzania grow from seven churches to about 70 churches, as I'm speaking to you right now. In Zambia, we have about four churches. We have about two two churches, three churches in Malawi. We are extending to Mozambique. Dr. Muhanji and all those that we spoke to for this episode are truly hopeful for what is to come next as the church expands. It won't be without its challenges, but they're confident that Quakers are answering the needs of their community. And I can assure you, the world is looking for Quakerism, for Quaker values.
we're not done yet. Please join us next week as Hannah takes us inside a Quaker meeting on Easter Sunday, and we hear an energetic message from a Kenyan pastor. Here's a clip. We live a life, an extraordinary life, because we have God in us with power and authority who changes what man cannot do. Can somebody say amen? Yes. This is Jesus that we preach. Thank you for listening, and thank you to all of our guests for being a part of this episode. Hannah and I learned so much, and we really are so thankful for your virtual hospitality and your in-person hospitality. If you'd like to learn more about this episode, please head over to our website, quakerpodcast.com. This episode was recorded by me, Georgia Sparling, and Hannah Mayer. I also produced this episode. And Hannah and I conducted all of the interviews. John Watts composed the music. Studio D mixed the episode. Kelly Nyanchama was our voice actor. And your moment of Quaker Zen was read by Grace Gonklevsky. The Quaker Podcast is a part of The Quaker Project, a Quaker media organization whose focus is on lifting up voices of spiritual courage and giving Quakers a platform in 21st century media. If you want to partner with us, please consider becoming a monthly supporter. Every contribution expands our capacity to tell Quaker stories in a fresh way, and it makes this project more sustainable. Visit QuakerPodcast.com for more information. And now for your moment of Quaker Zen. Be still and cool in thy own mind and spirit from thy own thoughts, and then thou wilt feel the principle of God to turn thy mind to the Lord God, whereby thou wilt receive his strength and power from whence life comes, to allay all tempests against blusterings and storms. George Fox, 1658. Sign up for daily or weekly Quaker wisdom to accompany you on your spiritual path. Just go to dailyquaker.com. That's dailyquaker.com.